Herzliya Conference 2012. Herzliya Conference 2012. Special interviews, highlights, and live broadcasts on IDC Radio. Welcome to the IDC Radio at 106.2 FM or online at 1062fm.co.il. My name is Anouk Lori and producing this segment is Irit Livne. Here with me is Dr. Marta Lucia Ramirez, former Defense Minister of Colombia, uh, former Foreign Trade Minister, former Senator, former presidential candidate in the last presidential race. Uh, Marta, uh, Lucia, welcome to the 11th annual Herzliya Conference. Uh, your talk at the conference tomorrow is about women in national security. Uh, I was particularly interested in your insights this year because of the unique position you held in Colombia uh, as the only female Minister of Defense in 2002 and in 2003, where under President Alvaro Uribe, uh, you were able to implement changes that led to a significant decrease in violence in Colombia. Uh, mar many pa paramilitary groups were demobilized uh, and the guerrillas lost control of much of the territory uh, they once dominated. The homicide rate also almost halved uh, between 2002 and 2006. Uh, however, I must uh, uh, remind our listeners that Colombia still remains the world's largest producer of cocaine. So uh, 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 let's be optimistic, but not too much. Uh, Marta, do you think that more women should hold key defense and security positions? Uh, and if more women were in charge, would there be less conflict in the world? Uh, many women think so, me included. What do you think about women uh, in defense positions? Uh, first of all, Anouk, thank you for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here in Israel. I'm so happy to participate in this uh, 12 conference, Hercilia conference. I know how important it is and how important it's uh, to, to share our experiences, not only about uh, economy, but also about the conflict resolution. Uh, as you said, um, it's a, a challenging position to be a defense minister. And in my case, I believe that uh, I'm not only the only one woman who has been a, a defense minister in Colombia, but also the only woman who has been a defense minister in a conflict, mm -hmm. uh, during a conflict in, in a country. Uh, and it was, uh, of course, uh, the most important experience in my uh, career. And it was also a, something very positive because uh, President Uribe, his leadership, and also the cooperation from the international community, from some specific countries like the United States, some of the European countries, Israel, of course, it was a very important cooperation in order to fight against guerrilla, against paramilitary, against narco-traffickers, because this is something very difficult. When narco-traffic is involved in a conflict, when narco-traffic is involved in the war, it's too difficult to achieve a peace. So that's why we were very focused in this um, fight against the illegal groups, but also very focused in provide protection to all the Colombian citizens. And this is something that women, we know how to do it. We, women are, uh, we are, uh, because of gender, of course, we are uh, very familiar about to protect, to protect family, to protect citizens, to protect all over uh, around us. And it was something that we implement in the security policy, how the military forces and how the police become better protecting the Colombian citizens. So you're saying that as a woman, with this instinct that you have of protection, or it might be called the motherly instinct, you think that helped you towards your goal of protecting your citizens? Uh, I believe that yes, because uh, we developed a, a strategic plan uh, for 10 years uh, in order to reduce homicides, to reduce kidnapping, in order to reduce uh, terrorist attacks. And we were very focused in how the military and the police could be successful in these goals, uh, trying to protect better the citizens. For example, for many years, the military and the police 
they were um, taking control of their own bases instead of being on the streets protecting the citizens. So that's why it was very easy for the guerrilla to kidnap many people in the Colombian uh, roads, in the Colombian uh, rural areas. But when we put the military and when we put the police uh, taking control of the roads, the kidnap were reduced very rapid. Uh, let me tell you uh, some numbers. In Colombia, in year 2002, we used to have 3,200 3, kidnapped every year. That's a lot. Uh, last year, Colombia has 140 uh, kidnapped. This is, of course, a lot, but comparing 140 with 3,200 10 years ago, you can see how this um, attitude towards the protection of citizens has changed uh, dramatically in our country. Uh, Israel's security policy is determined mostly by men. Uh, there has never been a female defense minister in Israel or a female chief of staff for that matter. Uh, do you think that appointing women to these positions could be helpful in Israel? And what added value do you think that a woman could bring to that position? Uh, of course, I, I cannot uh, uh, say in Israelians, what do you have to do? But of course, I believe that a, a woman in security, a women as a defense minister, we know that we have a change a dramatically in our countries. This is a, the Colombian experience. Um, in my case, uh, I was very clear that the um, goal to bring peace to uh, our country, it was a goal that we have to share, the civilian and, of course, the military. The civilian must be a defense minister as a civilian who uh, give the civilian control to the military, but also to bring the civilian support to the military. And that's why I'm talking about uh, this balance, because uh, we need the military, and also the military need the civilian in order to have a legitimacy, in order to have the population support. So... Uh, as a defense minister, I was clear and I was convinced that uh, if we want to achieve the peace of Colombia, the security for uh, Colombians, the strength of our democracy, we need to work in a collaborative uh, uh, attitude and we need to uh, introduce some reforms within the military. Of course, it was not easy. I introduced some uh, deep reforms in different fields, for example, in the budget, in the control of the uh, uh, military expenditures. And it was difficult because they used to um, manage this as a security uh, issue. But I was looking not only for security, but also for efficiency, for transparency, for legitimacy. How and that's why I said we need to show the country, we need to show the Colombians how efficient and how transparent we are in the use of this uh, budget for, for the military. And it was difficult, as I mentioned, but at the end of the day, I was success in that goal. How were you perceived by the military men in your country when you tried to tell them uh, how to run their so-called business? Mm. I, 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 when you when you speak about the military men, uh, there is a unfair generalization, mm -hmm. because uh, of course militars are very close. They have this solidarity between them, but of course there are some with a more modern uh, thinking, with a more modern attitude. Some sometimes. So that's why in this uh, military expenditure and all, sometimes uh, some of the military decisions, there were very, uh, there were some very in favor of all the changes. Uh, there were some others that were against, of course. Uh, and as you know, in the military, there is this line of command. This is this respect for the hierarchy. So sometimes those who were in favor, they were in the second or third level, so they were. Uh, silent or they were very shy about supporting these uh, measures. But what it's important is that you are clear enough about 
uh, the goals that you uh, have uh, about uh, the necessity to work together and to share responsibilities and about the um, uh, responsibility to change your country, to provide peace, not only for the present, but also for the long term of your country and for the future generations. And if you do this without ego, uh, if you do this uh, with a historic responsibility, you are ready to, to negotiate with them and you are ready to uh, um, do those, those changes. Uh, and at the end of the day, you could be successful. This uh, ego sometimes is a devil that affects uh, the relations uh, within governments, within cabinets, within the civil, civilian and military uh, relations, and this is bad for the country. What do you think of Israel's unique position of drafting its women into the military? I believe that uh, Israel has uh, achieved uh, something that I really admire. First of all, uh, every woman and man goes to the military service. This is something which is so important because it shows uh, the civilian population that the responsibility with the future is not only from the militaries, it's also from the civilian population. Everybody who has uh, children in the military, they are um, interested, they are committed, they are supportive of the military. And it, uh, you really need that in a society in order to be success against uh, illegal activities, against terrorism, against the enemies of your country and your uh, democracy. Uh, in Israel, I like very much uh, that I met so many women as officials in the military, um, uh, in the army. Uh, we had a cooperation, bilateral cooperation between Colombia and Israel, as I mentioned. Uh, and uh, when I was a minister of defense, uh, in that moment, it was not uh, easy for a woman to become an official they have to stop when they were in this uh, in the lieutenant uh, level they have to leave uh, the army right now it is changing right now because the president Uribe and myself we introduce some criteria about how women could uh, change in a positive way not only the military for the operations uh, sometimes intelligence, for example, but also how women can improve the organization in the military forces and uh, logistics in the military forces. So we have uh, right now women who are uh, in this um, career, uh, women who are in the line of command, and I hope that we are going to have women as generals yeah, unfortunately, I'm not going to be alive to see them maybe in 30 years or something like this, but I know that we are going to have some in Colombia. Let me tell you something. In Colombia, the military and the police both depend on the Minister of Defense. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, pol in the police, it was the same. There were no women uh, in the very high levels of the official um, side of the, of the police because of these reforms that myself and President Uribe that we introduce, right now we have in Colombia two women as the generals in the police, in the Colombian police. So uh, I really believe that women involved in the security issues and in the peace uh, are necessary because our societies, uh, our societies deserve and need this uh, women vision about uh, the family, about the country, about the children, and about the future. You mentioned you admire Israeli women going to the military, uh, uh, but unfortunately, even in Israel, even within the military, there are very few women who can actually go and fight in combat units. Uh, I think that's still one uh, prejudice, even within the military, to think that uh, women should be in positions of uh, bureaucracy, but not uh, go out and fight for the country uh, because of this idea that a woman might be too weak uh, in a situation of war or conflict. What's your opinion on that? I believe that women are uh, capable to be trained. And to be trained, it means that are capable to go to combat operations. 
Of course, it depends because if uh, we can train women as commandos, I'm sure that they can do it. Uh, I know that in Colombia we have women in the guerrilla. And let me tell you something. The most brave women who were in the um, inner circle of the very high-level uh, uh, combatants, in the very high-level uh, guer uh, guerrilla uh, commanders, they were women in the inner circle. So uh, they were protecting them and they were fighting with them. So, of course, women are capable to be in the very high levels in the military institutions. Um, depending on the training, they will be ready to go to the field and to combat. I'm sure of that. And, of course, in the Air Force, because today uh, it's so important to have this strength in the military, all the Air Force. In Colombia, we have uh, women who are, um, uh, who are in, in the... In the war um, uh, airplanes, and mm -hmm. they are doing very well. Um, we've been talking primarily about your position as defense minister, but in the past several years, you've also been involved in civil projects, uh, primarily aimed at fighting corruption in your country. Uh, Israel also suffers, unfortunately, from many political corruption scandals. Uh, and recently, Israel fell to the 36th place in 2011's Corruption Perceptions Index, uh, which is its lowest ranking ever. Uh, what have you found effective in the battle against corruption in Colombia? Yeah, let me tell you that, unfortunately, corruption is one of the most important problems right now in Colombia. Uh, and corruption uh, means that uh, not only the politicians, but different levels in the society has been infiltrated by corruption. Uh, in, in our country, we have a big problem, which is narcotraffic. Narcotraffic, as you said in, at the beginning of this interview, Colombia used to be the most important producer of cocaine in all over the world. Now, I'm not sure if we are in the first or the second place, because as you know, Afghanistan has a lot of uh, narcotics also, cocaine and uh, opium, uh, whatever. Uh, but which is very sad is that we have right now in Latin America so many countries involved in narcotics. Uh, Mexico, as you know, they are suffering a lot because of narcotraffic. Um, in Peru... In Bolivia, Ecuador, some of them are not uh, only producers, but uh, they are these uh, countries where drugs uh, dealers are uh, using to traffic from some of these countries to others in the hemisphere, and of course Venezuela. So that's why it's important to be clear that narcotraffic is a big threat uh, for uh, institutions, it's a big threat for societies, and it's a big threat for the health of our children. So, so what's your strongest tool against corruption? Because uh, so in Israel it's not primarily about narco-traffic, but corruption is corruption and to so battle it. Yeah, so, so I, I was mentioning corruption because it makes a difference with the Israel. As you said, here you have uh, problems with politicians, but uh, politics uh, are also related with the civilian. So when you have, for example, the expenditure, uh, you have somebody in the civilian side who is offering money, who is offering uh, gifts, who is offering bribes. trouble or bribes to people who are taking decisions. So what you need is to uh, provide transparency. Transparency in all the decisions that you take as a public servant. Transparency in all the budget and how do you use the budget because it reduces the room for corruption. Uh, and of course, you need an attitude in the society. A, a, a society against corruption is going to be a better society for the future. So I'm sure that uh, if you uh, put the control not only in the political side, but also in the civil population, in the uh, in private uh, enterprises, in companies, uh, if you have uh, strong laws against bribes that you offer to public servants, I believe that you can have a, a better um, future in that. Uh, as I said, unfortunately, Colombia is suffering a lot about corruption. Uh, so that's why we cannot say we solve the problem, but we are in the process to solve through transparency. 
uh, on a different issue, South America as a whole has generally been a very staunch supporter of the Palestinian cause uh, and often very critical of Israel. Do you think that Colombia, which like Israel has a history of security threats, uh, might have a different view of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Let me tell you something. Uh, it's true that some of the Latin American countries are very in favor of the Palestinian cause. Uh, in last year, when this uh, resolution in the United Nations, some of the Latin American countries support the Palestinian uh, proposal, not Colombia. Colombia no, uh, never uh, support uh, the resolution, but of course Colombia wants to uh, uh, help to achieve peace in Israel and of course with the, the Palestinians. So um, it's uh, important to understand that we in Colombia, because we have suffered a lot because of terrorism, we are very familiar with all this suffering that creates in Israel to have uh, terrorists from Palestine or from different places fighting uh, or uh, attacking uh, sometimes your civilian population. We have this cooperation, uh, bilateral cooperation, and we believe that um, it's also necessary to have the international community very committed uh, uh, fighting against terrorism and against terrorists. Uh, it's so sad that we have so many resolutions in the Security Council that are not uh, very effective. For example, uh, in year 2000, it was a very important resolution uh, against those countries that provide uh, support and that provide a uh, share uh, for, for uh, terrorists. But nothing happens, and Colombia has suffered a lot because of that. For example, for many years we were very uh, concerned about the guerrilla uh, coming back and forth in the Colombian and Venezuelan border. And we were asking for intervention of United Nations uh, through uh, resolutions or whatever, and it was not uh, enough. So uh, we need to, to, to develop this uh, understanding from the international community that terrorism is bad, and is bad no matter where or no matter who is the country who is, uh, which is affected. Finally, uh, you ran for presidency in Colombia in 2010, as I mentioned before. Uh, do you plan on running in the next election? Uh, let me tell you something. Women, when we decide to go to politics, we are different than men. For me, politics is not my goal. For me, politics is uh, just a tool to serve to my country. Uh, but I'm not ready to do whatever uh, it's necessary to do uh, to have the power. I'm not going to buy a vote. I'm not going to offer contracts, never. So if there is a room for me to run again, I'm going to do it. it it's difficult. Uh, the political um, scenario is uh, easier sometimes for men because... Uh, some of them, they, they just want to have the power. I just want to help my country. I just want to serve my country. So uh, I'm going to, to, to see. If there is a room, I'm going to try. If not, uh, there are so many places to, to serve my country. Right now, I'm a chair of two different NGOs. One of them is working with the uh, soldiers, the former and the mobilized members of the guerrilla, and also a civilian population who were affected by mines. Uh, so this is something very important to, to do, how we can put these three groups working together in order to have education, in order to have a productive uh, products, uh, in order to have productive um, businesses and, uh, and projects. Uh, and there is another uh, NGO which is called Citizen Action Ship, and I am also the chair, because we want to promote uh, the young people to be involved in politics, to be involved in civilian uh, um, work with the society, the solidarity, to create more uh, room for education for the poor uh, children in, in some of the rural Colombia village. So uh, what is important is to be clear about where you can serve in each moment of your life. Right now, this is not my moment for politics. Um, maybe in the future. Well, I hope for the sake of your country that they see you running again, not just because you are a woman, but because you also seem to have very interesting ideas. Uh, Thank you, Luke. 
Dr. Marta Lucia Ramirez, thank you so much for your time. Uh, enjoy the rest of the Herzliya conference here at IDC. Thank you. Thank you so much. And a big hug for all the Israelis who are listening to us right thank now. Thank you so much. Uh, you're listening to the IDC radio at 106.2, and I'm Anouk Lori. Thank you. <laughs>